Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. We are back in our study in Galatians, and I just want to thank every one of you for your participation. Father, again, we stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so thankful for the privilege that you've given us to feast upon your precious word. May the Holy Spirit be the one who teaches us filtering out foolishness and ignorance, but opening our hearts to truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We are studying together in the epistle to the Galatians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had reached verse 8, I believe, of chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. There had been a group of believers who had suggested that law had to be kept as well as the grace of God in the finished work of Christ. This dispute, it became so intense that Paul and Barnabas went up to Jerusalem to talk to the disciples there, and the result of that meeting was the conclusion was that Paul's gospel was the same gospel that they preached. They put no restrictions on him. And in the fourth chapter, we've been looking at the fact that though we are heirs, because we are Abraham's seed, and we are Abraham's seed because we're Christ's, we belong to Him, and Christ bought us by His finished work, we're heirs according to the promise. This was true before Jesus Christ died. But since the heir was a minor, even though He's Lord of all the inheritance, all of the inheritance is His, but he's a minor, so he was put under tutors and governors until the time, an appointed time, that God had set aside and, and God appointed. We saw in the third chapter, that's when Jesus Christ came. And as a result of the finished work, his finished work, the finished work of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, we've been placed in sonship. And I suggested that one aspect of that is what is what we call the new birth in the scriptures, born from above. We are God's sons because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It does not mean our common word for adoption that you were somebody else's son and then by law you were made somebody else's son. That's not the case here. This is to be placed in the mature position as sons. And that is based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so to suggest then that law is necessary is to diminish Christ and what He did. Verse 8, How be it then when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. You know, just think law keepers who rule over those who are not under law. In verse 9, But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God. What a wonderful verse. Uh, the word know is gnosko, experiential knowledge. What that verse is saying, dearly beloved, is that God knows us and we know Him intimately. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? That is turning back to law. Verse 10 you observe days and months. Now this has nothing to do with prophecy. And times and years. 
Okay? They are observing days and months and times and years, and of course, that's law. Verse 11, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain, says the text. Okay, labor, labor is a verb in the Greek that it's in the perfect tense. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is saying that what was done there was completely done, that what Paul preached was, was correct. Uh, there were not any deficiencies in it. And Paul has a fear. I am being afraid of you. It's a present passive. I'm being made afraid of you. Lest there is the chance that all of that work which I've accomplished was for nothing. Was in vain. I do not believe the eternal destiny of these people is the underlying subject of the passage. What is the important consideration is their maturity in Christ. They're, they're growing up into a mature relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. You haven't done me any wrong. Now let's, let's look at that verse. Okay, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as you are. Okay, these are Gentiles, but these Gentiles are being taught that they need to be subject to the law. It may not be as apparent as it ought to be, but if there is something else necessary other than the finished work of Jesus Christ for your redemption, then you have by that much diminished what Christ did. You're making the Lord Jesus Christ less than the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you're doing. You are demeaning the work that He did by suggesting that you have to finish it or you have to add to it. And that makes His work, what He did, deficient. I beseech you, be as I am. Paul says, well, what is he saying? For I am as ye are. Well, he's saying that I am free from the law because I became a Gentile. Here I'm a, I'm a Jew and I'm beseeching you to be as I am free from the law. For I became as you are a Gentile. That had nothing to do with the, with the law. What a tremendous testimony. Here is a Pharisee of, here's the Apostle Paul, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a skilled Hebrew scholar. I mean, of all the people who ought to be proclaiming the law and professing obedience to the law, it ought to be Paul. But Paul became as a Gentile separate from the law. I plead with you, be as I am. Okay? Now, folks, forget for a moment the, the, the words of Paul. This is the appeal of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's pleading is that we recognize the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. What we're looking at here is not unique to Galatia. <laughs> okay? It has been the constant battle in the church. Humanism, human goodness, human works. Anything to add to the finished work of Jesus Christ. It isn't adding to, it's diminishing. To stand before God Almighty and suggest that He didn't do enough. That He only began a process that He leaves into the hands of mortal flesh to finish Far beyond Paul is the pleading of the Holy Spirit. You are not under law. This is the Holy Spirit pleading to you and I. We are not under law. And I have given you a marvelous illustration of that in Paul, the Holy Spirit would say. 
just remember in Timothy where he's said to be an example of all those who should hereafter believe on Jesus Christ. The one person who ought to preach law, to be subject to the law, and to be zealous for the law would have been the Apostle Paul. And the Holy Spirit says, I gave you that example for all who should hereafter believe in Jesus Christ. Amazing. You know, the insidious side of sin, folks, is that it leads you to believe that Jesus Christ did not do enough. Oh, I plead with you, shed the shackles of the law. You know, verse 13, you know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. The word know there is oida. It's a perfect tense. You really know, you completely know that by means of weakness I preached the gospel to you at the first. There's a tremendous amount of, of literature suggesting that, you know, what that weakness was. Yeah, bad eyes. You know, he's going to say in a little bit, you see how large a letter I've written unto you? You know, in just a couple of verses, he's going to say they would have plucked out their eyes, you know, to, and given them to him. So he must have had bad eyes. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. And there isn't any reason to believe that if they'd plucked out their eyes and given them to Paul, that it would have worked. I am not sure that you can use that as solid evidence that the Apostle Paul had an eye problem. Maybe he did. I, I don't know. But others have said, well, he obviously he had malaria and he had... He had to get up to a higher altitude, you know, so he can handle the malaria and get well. I don't know what this weakness is. The literal language would suggest that he had some kind of a repulsive infirmity, something, something that would lead somebody to believe that they didn't want to be with him or see him or talk to him. I find that so amazing. And why that verse is there, I don't believe it's there for us to speculate on what that weakness was. But to point out to you, folks, that the power of what was preached was the Holy Spirit, not the strength of Paul. Let me say that again. The power of the Holy Spirit, not the strength of Paul. You know that I wasn't there aggressively. I wasn't there, I wasn't there pushing my agenda by means of weakness of the flesh. I preached the gospel unto you at the first. Dearly beloved, we don't want that. That's not the kind of preaching that we want. We don't, we don't want that. No, 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 no. We want somebody who's smart and rich and handsome and successful and you know, he's worthy to preach. We want something fleshly. You know, there isn't a group of people that, that would get together and say, you know, all right, we're going to have a meeting. We're going to bring somebody in to preach the gospel. The guy we're going to bring in, well, he's, he's weak, he's sick, and he's ugly. No way. You know, no way. We, we got to somehow sell you people on this guy that you ought to come listen to. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, if we could just get so-and-so converted, you know, this guy, he's really very influential. So if we could just get him converted, I mean, think of how many people we'd get, we'd get converted. That's a, that's a common carnal conclusion. Dearly beloved, listen to me. There wasn't any reason to listen to Paul. No reason at all. I think the language indicates that there wouldn't be any reason to look at him. Now, I don't know what that was. 
Some suggest that that was because he was stoned and left for dead. I, oh, how that must have disfigured him. I don't know. I don't know that, neither do you. I don't know whether that's what is meant here. But he wasn't preaching in his power. Why is that verse there? It's there because the Holy Spirit wants you to realize that it isn't the agency of the flesh, but it is if you're living under law. If, if keeping the law is necessary to be redeemed, then you're redeemed by works of the flesh. You know, flesh has got to do something good. And the Holy Spirit, I believe, is telling you and telling me that it's weak for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. You know, don't you people realize? That that's what the Holy Spirit is saying. Don't you people realize that what, what you're suggesting is that Redemption is based upon the strength of the flesh. You know absolutely that it was by means of weakness of the flesh that I preached the good news to you the very first time. Flesh didn't have anything to do with it. It was weak. It was ineffective. And my temptation which was in my flesh, your newer translations I'm sure I'll say, and your temptation, which was in my flesh. And I believe that to be the correct word. I believe that there are several cases in the Word of God where God has left the Greek word not unknown at all, but a couple of possibilities because both are important. There isn't anything, I don't believe, anything wrong with my temptation and there isn't anything wrong with your temptation because both were true. The weakness of Paul, whatever that was, I have no idea what that was, but it was a trial to, to Paul. It was a trial to him. You know, if you were asked to sing in church, I'm sure you'd want to do a, a, a beautiful job. I don't suppose any of you really want to get up and sing off key. I mean, I mean, I mean, if that's if that's what you like, well, you know, you could ask me to sing a solo before each video. No, no, you'd want to do the best you could, and surely, if you were going to preach, you'd want to do the best that you could. You know, I listen to some preachers and I think, golly, man, that, that guy's a real, he's a real orator. I can't speak, I can't speak like that. I, some of it is really marvelous and I'd like to do that. I want to do the best I can. I spend hours studying so that when somebody asks me questions, I'm not just totally off guard, but I want to do a good job. I do. I want to do a good job. There is no doubt in my mind at all that a Pharisee of the Pharisees, skilled in all of the learning of his day, I, I'd put the because I I'd, I'd put the learning of Paul beyond most of the people that you know. Most of the people I know in in linguistics and understanding the scriptures is a highly educated guy, and in his flesh, I mean, surely if he were to preach. He'd want to do the best job he could. And whatever's the problem here, I'm, well, I'm fairly certain it was a trial for Paul. There are other manuscripts, folks, that say my preaching was a trial for you. Okay? I don't think Paul was a great orator. Some have suggested that the stoning that left him almost dead at Lister, one of those stones that well, it must have hit him in the throat. You know, or you'd say, you know, he probably couldn't speak very well. 
I don't know. What I do know, based on the Word of God, is that the, what the Holy Spirit, I believe, is saying is the vessel I used to bring the marvelous good news of grace was not only sick, but he was repulsive. And that was a trial for him. And it was a trial for those who heard him. Isn't that interesting? The undercurrent of, of that you can see in Corinthians. And I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That your faith might not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know, I like gardening, uh, as some of you know. Uh, I guess the older I get, the more I'm convinced. You know, I know a well of a lot more about the Bible than I know about gardening. But I like it. But I don't know all that much about it. I mean, if you saw my tomatoes this year, you'd know that. And I suppose myself to be an expert at, at watering some seed that I threw down on the ground. But I watch these videos on farming and gardening, you know, and I sit back wowed by the graphics, you know, and, and, I, and I, I find as I listen to these experts that I've missed entirely what they were trying to present. I've, I'll sit there, here I am, I'm sitting there figuring, well, you know, thinking, well, how did they get that little plant to grow, you know, to maturity in three seconds or or look at all the colors on that screen and, you know, and stuff is flipping and, and spinning around and stuff, stuff I never saw on the screen before. And I'm sitting there absolutely mesmerized by the beauty of those graphics and those special effects or those, you know, tr transitions or whatever they are. And, and the information that they're trying to teach me is almost lost in all the glitter. I like, I like to hear an orator. I like to hear a man who's cogent in his thinking. I enjoy somebody who's well organized and can speak well. And I think that the Holy Spirit is saying, this, this is what I believe. I believe that He's saying that your faith might not stand in the wisdom of men or the strength of the flesh. You know, you people are suggesting to me, and, and, and I, I shouldn't use you people. The Holy Spirit says, has Paul say, you're suggesting that we ought to keep the law. That you're suggesting that we ought to be circumcised. You're suggesting that we ought to keep the law, so you're saying that the strength of the flesh is important, but you remember, surely... Surely, you know, perfect tense, you know, you absolutely know that it was by means of weakness and trial that I preached the gospel to you at the first. My testing, your testing, which was in my flesh or your flesh, I think you can put either word there, Okay, your translation may say my, or it may, your, or your translation may say your. I really believe they're both there. You can find ancient Greek manuscripts with both of them there. Why? Because uh, there's a mistake? No. Because I believe the Holy Spirit wants you to know, wants me to know, that it was a trial for Paul and it was a trial for the Galatians. It was really a trial, a testing to listen to Him, and it was in His flesh. It wasn't in His message. And I don't know what it was, but the language, folks, leads me to believe that it was repulsive. You did not despise. The word not is the word ooh in the Greek. You absolutely it's a strong negative. You absolutely did not despise nor reject me. More than that, you welcomed me 
as a messenger of God, as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Now, that has to be the working of the Holy Spirit. You know, you listen to some speaker and you think, well, you know, that guy, he, he's just terrible. You know, what he said was right, but his, his countenance, you know, his, was not impressive at all. Why? Because you was looking for the power of the flesh in the message. It, it was a good message, but it wasn't, it wasn't an impressive message to you. It was, it was a trial for you to listen to the guy. It was a trial for him to speak. Okay? But you didn't despise me. You didn't reject me. In fact, you welcomed me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where then is that blessing? That graciousness that you spoke of? For I'm willing to testify that if, if it had been possible, you would have gouged out your own eyes and have given them to me. Wow. Now, I'm not at all that convinced that, the, that that's proof that he had an eye problem. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I've, had, I've, read, I've read several articles. I have read several articles that he could, have, he, he could have eye problems that are so repulsive nobody would want to look at him, and I, I don't doubt that. And for that, they've taken this verse to say it had to be his eyes. I, I don't know whether it was his eyes or not. What it does say, what it does say is here's one who was repulsive in appearance, who was weak, sick, and yet what he preached so gripped their hearts that they were blessed, therefore they received him. They so welcomed him that they were willing to give the most precious thing they had if it would help him. You know, I, different than today. I mean, back in Paul's day, your most precious possession was, was, was your eyesight. I mean, you could do better without an arm or a leg. You know, you, you, could, be, you could do better not hearing then you could do blind. I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of help for those who are visually impaired today. That was the most precious thing that they had. You know, you might be impressed. I suppose if the verse said, I bear you record that you know, you'd have given me a million dollars if you had it. Folks, the verse is more powerful than that. Than that. They would have given a million dollars in a minute. Before they had given their eyes. I think what the Holy Spirit is saying is that the truth of this message preached in weakness and repulsiveness of the flesh was so blessed that they trade the most precious thing they had to help the messenger. I don't know whether the gospel has ever grabbed your heart like that. To believe that God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, monarch of, of eternity, knows you so intimately that He bought you, He died in your place to redeem you. You didn't ask Him to. You didn't want Him to. You didn't know about it. I can't imagine greater news than that. 
seriously, if you really know him and love him, what would you trade for your relationship with Jesus Christ? More than the most precious thing you have. We live in a time where there's so much glitter that just as some of the garden videos I saw obscured the message that they were trying to, pre to present, that happens a lot in the gospel. What we have are a couple of verses that say what was preached, the truth, the validity of what was presented is so much more valuable than the way that the orator looked or his physical condition that you'd trade the most precious thing you have for it. It's so easy to take it all for granted. You know, we blithely accept it and we go on, on our merry way. I mean, you know, we're a church, folks. We're a group of believers who gather together and all kinds of fleshly things are going to crop up to interfere with our fellowship and our communion. This isn't the first church I've pastored, but it is the first church where I've heard so little criticism of one another. We're not here to do that. This ministry is not about that. We are above that. We should be above that. I think we are above that. Why? Because you people, and I'm including myself, I should say all of us, we are weak and repulsive. That's what we are. There isn't a single person hearing this message who's awesome sauce, okay? okay all right? And there isn't anybody here that we should bow down before we are the filth and the offscouring of the world system. Okay? It would be, it, folks, it would be a disaster to broadcast on the screen the truth of our lives. I don't want to know your failures and you don't want to know mine. But we are loved by the eternal God. He purchased us and we are new creations in Christ Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is working in us to form Christ in us. That's His purpose. And we need to live above that weakness of the flesh, that, that repulsiveness. I'm personally of the mind, I, I would hope that you would listen to my old donkey preach. You know, if he was preaching the gospel... And not to me if I was not preaching the gospel. In that respect, I shouldn't have to worry, I guess, that much about how I look or, or what you think of me or, you know. But I do. I, I'm just like you. You know, like maybe if I wear a white hat as opposed to a black hat, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look more Christ-like or whatever. You know, dearly beloved, the brother that led me to the Lord, listen to me, the brother that led me to Christ, whom I came to dearly love and respect, was fat and smelly. All right? I'm, I'm just, if you were, if it were not for the purity of the gospel that that dear brother teached, I would not have wanted to hang out with the guy. At least, most of the time, we can't see that which is repulsive in each other, but, but, but they could in Paul. They could in Paul, yet, but Paul's message, folks, transcended that. The message was vastly superior to the filth and the repulsiveness of the flesh, and I believe it is cru crucial, it's crucially important that we as a body of believers recognize that we're going to have difficulties in the flesh. We're going to have disappointments. And we're going to be angry. But we ought to live above that. The message is so much greater 
folks, than the vessels that contain it. You know, there were poor vessels, but a marvelous message. Am I therefore now become your enemy? It's a perfect tense. Have I, have I completely become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? That's a, that is a present participle. And the present participle says that it's concurrent with the main verb, enemy, because of truth. Because of truth. There's been, a, there's been a, know, many, many times I felt that what I knew and what I believed was absolute truth and I found out it wasn't. You know, I, I don't think normally we like to hear the truth. We like to hear what we want to hear and we like to see done what we think, you know, is right to be done whether or not we know all the facts. The Holy Spirit is saying here that the Word of God is truth. Whether we like it or not, it's truth. The flesh is despicable. The flesh is weak. The flesh, the flesh has no merit in the proclamation of the message. Why then should we become enemies based on fleshly things? I'm proclaiming the truth. Paul says, are the legalizers, are... Are, are they who want you under law proclaiming truth? They zealously court you. I don't know what your Bible says. They zealously affect you or court you, but not in an honorable way. Not in an honorable way. Now, the way the Holy Spirit does is honorable. He does it in truth. You know, we handle truth in funny ways. It depends on what the meaning of is is. They are zealously courting you. They're not doing it honorably because they are bringing dishonor to Jesus Christ. They are making Jesus Christ less than He is. And they're making the finished work of, of Jesus Christ less than it was Dearly beloved, listen to me. Until I'm dead, I'm going to tell you this. You are not redeemed because of one single thing you ever did. You're not redeemed because you believed. You're not redeemed because you received. You're not redeemed because you repented. You're not redeemed because you're, you're baptized. You are redeemed because Jesus Christ, God Almighty, died in your place and rose from the dead. This is the gospel that we preach. Jesus Christ came into this world. He died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day from the dead. That's the good news. That's truth. These people, these people are not zealously courting you in an honorable way. Because they are making Jesus Christ less than He is and making what He did less than what it was. They are exalting a despicable and a weak flesh. <coughs> Praise God, you are not redeemed by anything you do. If, Folks, if you even touch a tool to the stones with which you build the altar, you defile it. If you even go, if you even go up steps to offer sacrifice, you defile it. Because it's work to go up steps. And going up steps reveals the flesh. Paul knew those things. They were, they were part of the law, the Old Testament. You know, obviously back then, you know, they probably didn't make a, a whole a whale of a lot of sense to a lot of people. I, I, don't, I don't know whether the rabbis understood it, but adding anything from the flesh to the finished work of Christ defiles it. They do not seek you in an honorable way. 
They do that so that they can separate you so that you have to court them. They want to control you. You know, if we can get people centered in the responsibility of the flesh, we can control them. Dangerous to give them the liberty that's yours in Christ. You know, the things that, that Luther and, and Calvin said about the Pope must have really ticked off the Pope. You know, you're free, you're new creations in Christ Jesus, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. There's nothing wrong with being zealously, our text is making it clear, there's nothing wrong with being zealously courted. Not at all. Why is the 18th verse there? The 18th verse is there because the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to conclude from this series of verses that Paul was the only one that the Galatians should, ought to listen to. Now there are other preachers of the good news. And it's a good thing to be zealously courted. However, that always has to be in a good way. It has to be in an honorable way. It's a good thing to be zealously courted honorably, but it is a terrible thing to be courted in a dishonorable way such that you are now controlled. The law will control you. And what you will then manifest in your life is obedience to the law, not the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Your Word. We're thankful for the few moments that You've given us to think about it. May the Holy Spirit just take what's been said and filter out the foolishness, but seal the truth to our hearts that we might grow in grace and knowledge of You, that we might manifest Jesus Christ in our lives for it's in your name we pray. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pray for those that are struggling to recover from one of the greatest hurricane disasters, I think, in the modern era. Till next time, we love you all. We truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.